All right, well, good morning. Like I often do, I like to introduce you to someone in church history. And uh, here's, here's the quiz today. I want to tell you about this man. Anyone know who this man is? Oh, you've seen him. Did I hear someone say that? I've seen him. You recognize Do you have a guess? Oh, don't read on the back. No, you're a cheater. You're a cheater. This man, this man was, uh, he, he's in the news recently. He passed away September 27th, 2002. So that's like three weeks away. Uh, three weeks passed. He, he passed away. He's 94 years old. Uh, you may have heard about him in the news. His name is Andrew Vanderbeel, better known as Brother Andrew is who this, this man is. And uh, just having passed away a few weeks ago and just seeing some parallels in his life and Paul's life, I just thought it'd be good to tell you his story a little bit, maybe to stir you up by zeal, if, if nothing else. He was a Dutchman, as you can tell by his name. I don't even know if you say his name Vanderbeel or how you, you say it exactly, but uh, he was raised in a godly home, strayed in his youth, converted in his 20s, went off to a missionary training school in Glasgow, Scotland. And uh, upon graduation, really looking for the Lord's direction in his life, was um, just searching for that. And then he had an opportunity to visit Warsaw, Poland in 1955 when he was 27 years old. Mind you, 1955, this was behind the Iron Curtain. Poland was under communist control. And uh, he was able to go there kind of as a youth conference as they were trying to promote the, the nationalistic spirit of how good Poland was. And during his visit, he had an opportunity to slip away from his big group and he visited a Christian bookstore and was told how Bibles were rare, particularly behind the Iron Curtain. Maybe not right there in Warsaw, they weren't so much, but they were other places. And after a visit to Poland, he went to Czechoslovakia on a government-controlled tour. It was a little smaller um, but he slipped away on a, a Sunday one time, and, and um, actually not, that's a different story. In Czechoslovakia, um, he had a chance to, to find a, a Bible um, store, uh, and he found out how scarce Bibles were in Czechoslovakia. Um, he found a bookstore, the biggest bookstore uh, in Czechoslovakia, which was filled with music and stationary pictures, statues, crosses, and books. But when he asked for a Bible, there was no Bible to be found. And he said to the worker, Man, I've come, ma'am, I've come all the way from Holland to see how the church is faring in Czechoslovakia. Are you going to tell me that I can walk into the largest bookstore in the country and not be able to buy a single Bible? And then later in that tour, he, he slipped away from his tour, which was smaller, and, and he kind of slipped out of the back of a bus when no one was noticing. And he visited several churches, just kind of on his own, young man, 25, 27 years of age, and um, he said this about the church. He said, the service begun. I took my seat in the back and immediately had a surprise. Almost everyone in the service seemed farsighted. Uh, by, that, by that, he means this. He says, the owner of hymns books, he said, held them at, at arm's length. Have you guys ever seen that? Maybe you guys have done that. As, as I'm getting older, I'm doing the I'm, I'm doing this, this sort of thing. But he said that everyone was doing this sort of thing, and he was confused. He said that loose leaf notebooks, he did the same. And then I realized that the people with the books were sharing them with those who had none. In the notebooks you copied, were copied note by note, word by word, the favorite hymns of the congregation. And so it was the same with Bibles. When the pastor introduced his text, it is what he said, Every Bible owner in the congregation found a reference and held the Bible high up above so that those friends nearby could follow along the reading, he says. As I watched those men and women struggling literally to get close to the Word, my hand closed over my Dutch Bible in my coat pocket and how much for granted I had always taken my own right to own this book. I thought that I would never reach for it again without remembering the old granny in front of me now, standing almost on tiptoe, squinting, squinting as she strained to see the words in the Bible her son held aloft. And that trip, that encounter, that church service really changed Brother Andrew's life. He made it really a goal to get the Word of God behind the Iron Curtain into the hands of those people in communism. 
Now, just before I move on, just even, even this imagery alone, right? Might that stir you afresh in your own desire and heart for, for God's Word? Do you view it as precious and life-giving? Psalm 19 says it's sweeter than honey, it's, it's more precious than gold. Or do you have so many Bibles at home, it just sort of goes by the way? Well, Brother Andrew saw the need, and he came back from several of these trips, and he started to tell people these missionary stories about coming back, and funding started coming in to him, and he was given a Volkswagen Beetle to transport Bibles. And in 1957, he took his first trip in that very Beetle there to Yugoslavia. And at the border, he was aware of the fact that any printed material was liable to be confiscated at the border. It was regarded as foreign propaganda. And, And again, he wrote, Here I was with car and luggage literally bulging with tracts, Bibles, and portions of Bibles. How was I to get them past the border guard? And so for the first of many times, I said the prayer of God's smuggler. And he became known as God's smuggler. Lord, in my luggage, I have Scripture that I want to take to your children across the border. When you were on earth, you made blind eyes see. And now I pray, make seeing eyes blind. Do not let the guards see those things. You do not want them to see. And the Lord answered his prayer time and time and time again as he made many trips into the Soviet bloc in that very Volkswagen with copies of God's word. And looking back, Brother Andrew would say, I I promised God that as often as I could lay my hands on a Bible, I would bring it to these children of his behind the wall that men that men built to every country where God opened the door long enough for me to slip through. And he made many trips behind the Iron Curtain to bring Bibles to Christians. And even Daniel Silliman writes, no one knows how many Bibles Brother Andrew took to Poland, Czechoslovakia, Yugoslavia, East Germany, Bulgaria, and other Soviet bloc countries. Estimates have ranged into the millions. And they said a Dutch joke, a Dutch joke popular in the 1960s said this, what will the Russians find if they first arrive at the moon? They're going to find Brother Andrew with a load of Bibles. That was the joke. Because remember, that was Sputnik time, right? That was a time in which they were battling who's going to get to the moon or not. And his story was so fascinating, it was written in a book entitled God's Smuggler. It came out in 1967. The book was an instant bestseller, and since then it has sold more than 10 million copies And uh, one of the unintended consequences, however, of this book is that all of a sudden Brother Andrew was famous. He was a marked man. And uh, so he no longer could smuggle Bibles into these nations because they knew the books, they knew the border, they they knew and they would confiscate everything. And so now he had to step back from the work himself and just become one who would encourage the work. And he led then his mission organization called Open Doors. At this point, really, he adapted his role. No longer as the mule that bring Bibles into countries as they needed. Instead, he was the cheerleader that would urge people on in doing so. In fact, I even have a friend who brought some uh, Bibles, I remember, to Vietnam. And I remember him telling me that first phrase of Brother Andrews, God, when you were on earth, you made blind eyes to see and now make seeing eyes blind. And he was able to get a bunch of Bibles into Vietnam just even 15 years ago or so. Um, but his goal was to bring these Bibles in, to smuggle them in. Even when people disagreed with him, even in his day, even the American Bible Society and the Southern Baptist Convention Foreign Mission Board didn't support his practice of Bible smuggling. He said it was dangerous and ineffective. But Brother Andrew would basically reply that, yes, he broke the laws of the country, that they prohibit him from bringing in religious literature at the border, but oftentimes he just placed his literature out there in plain sight, for policemen to see at their checkpoints. And he relied upon the Lord to make blind eyes see, to make seeing eyes blind. And now when the Iron Curtain came down in the 1990s, he shifted his focus from the Bibles to the communistic world to reaching out to Muslims in the Middle East. Yet still his mission was the same, to get God's Word into the hands of as many people as he could get. When asked if he had any regrets about his life's work near the end, he says this, if I could live my life all over again, I would be a lot more radical. It's amazing coming from him. 
Well, I tell you that story, Brother Andrew, because he has many things in common with the Apostle Paul we're going to see in our text today. Both Brother Andrew and, and Paul were radical disciples of Christ. In fact, Brother Andrew once said in his later years, I, I think we in the West, he said, is a personal confession. He says, I think we in the West are cowards. He said, we ought to become people of guts and courage and strong convictions who don't count our lives as dear unto ourselves. Quoting Paul's very words in Acts chapter 20, verse 24, I do not count my life as dear to myself. Both Paul and Brother Andrew were were used the Lord to affect many lives. At the time of Brother Andrew's death, just a few weeks ago, Open Doors was was serving Christians in more than 60 countries, distributing still more than 300,000 Bibles every year. And of course, the Apostle Paul, we're still reading him today, hearing about his own life. Both Paul and Brother Andrew faced danger in their lives. I'm not sure you noticed, but here on this, this book, little small print, God's Smuggler, it says, when he crossed the iron borders of the Iron Curtain, would he be lucky or dead? Now, I don't like the word phrasing lucky, but, but just the whole idea there, right? What was going to happen at the border? Was he going to confiscate things? or even take him into captivity, imprisonment, and die. Like when, you read, when you read the book, it just kind of just fascinating. It's a page-turner, as I, I read it this week. Read half of it this week anyway. But last week, we heard of the danger that Paul would face when coming to Jerusalem. Imprisonments and afflictions awaited him, and possibly even death. Both Paul and Brother Andrew faced some controversy in their lives. Brother Andrew had people disagree with his method of smuggling Bibles. And last week we saw people told Paul not to go to Jerusalem, but Paul said, I'm going to Jerusalem. They said, don't go. He said, I'm going. Both Paul and Brother Andrew adapted their strategy when needed. Um, Brother Andrew shifted his focus when he wasn't able to smuggle Bibles himself. And when the Iron Curtain fell, he adjusted his strategy, went to places that would would need him more in the Muslim world. Um, and this is what we're going to see Paul doing. In fact, this is the last point that I want to look at this ready. Paul was, was ready to adapt his ministry as well, whatever came his way. My, my message this morning is entitled, Ready to Adapt. Um, it comes from Acts chapter 21, verses 15 through 26. So if you haven't done so already, I invite you to take your Bibles and you can open them up to Acts chapter 21. And you don't need to hold them like this because there's one in your front front seat if you need a Bible, if you haven't brought one, we encourage you to do so. Our text this week comes right after a text from last week in which we saw those in Tyre and in Caesarea telling Paul, don't go to Jerusalem. Don't go to Jerusalem, right? Because you're going to suffer there and, and you may die. But Paul, we saw last week, was willing to die. And, and, and when told not to go to Jerusalem, Paul said in chapter 21 and verse 13, He said, what are you doing, weeping or breaking my heart? I am ready not only to be imprisoned, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. He was willing to lay down his life for the Lord Jesus. Yet yet we see in our text this morning, as we continue this story, that it didn't mean that he was going to walk into his death. In fact, that's what we saw last week when we looked at John Shaw last week. Because I told you how he walked right into the camp of the North Sentinelese Island people. Walked right into his death. Right? He wasn't ready to adapt. Paul, however, was, was ready to adapt right? when he went in. right, He just saw the circumstance of the lay of the land, and he adapted so as to not just plunge himself into certain imprisonment and death. Well, let's read our text. Acts chapter 15, 21, verse 15 through 26. And after these days, we got ready and went up to Jerusalem. And some of the disciples from Caesarea went with us. Bring us to the house of Manasin of Cyprus, an early disciple with whom we should lodge. And when we come to Jerusalem, the brothers received us gladly. And on the following day, Paul went in with us to James, and all the elders were present. And after greeting them, he related one by one the things that God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified God. And they said to him, You see, brother, how many thousands there are among the Jews of those who have believed. They are zealous for the law, and they have been told about you that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or walk according to our customs. What then is to be done? They will certainly hear that you have come. Do therefore what we tell you. We have four men who are under a vow. 
Take these men and purify yourselves along with them and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads. Thus all will know that there is nothing in what you have been told about in what they have been told about you, but that you yourself also live in observance of the law. But as for the Gentiles who have believed, we have sent a letter with our judgment that they should abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols and from blood and from what has been strangled and from sexual immorality. Then Paul took the men, and the next day he purified himself along with them and went to the temple, giving notice when the days of purification would be fulfilled and the on the offering presented for each of them. Now, the first thing we see here in our text is Paul finishing his third missionary journey. Verse 15 says this, After these days we got ready and went up to Jerusalem. After several years and several thousand miles, Paul returned back to the land of the Jews. Going up to Jerusalem, because you always go up to Jerusalem, Jerusalem was in the hills. It was in the mountains, if you will. Maybe not quite like Denver, but But up and in the hills, when you go from the Sea of Mediterranean Sea up, you always go up to Jerusalem. And I trust by now you you have Paul's missionary journey in your mind, how he began the great church at Antioch, went across southern Galatia, went down as far as Corinth, retraced his steps, sailed back, landed in Tyre, went down to Caesarea, and now finally we see him returning to Jerusalem. Sadly, he never got back to his sending church. Because in Jerusalem, we're going to see him, indeed, the fulfilled prophecy is going to be bound and imprisoned, and he's going to be sent, actually, to Rome. But in coming to Jerusalem, we see Paul first submitting himself to the, the council of the elders. And, and, and first, he submitted to them in terms of where to stay. And I think this is Paul adapting. Like He wasn't like John Chow, just kind of charging right into the temple in Jerusalem, just ready to be arrested. No, he, he was wise about things. He, he said where to stay. And, and we get the sense here in verse 16, even that he was led, like this would be the best place for you to stay. And some of the disciples from Caesarea went with us, bringing us to the house of Manasseh of Cyprus, an early disciple with whom we should lodge. And the idea here is that Paul's not running a show. Rather, it's from those in Caesarea, who had a better understanding of the lay of the land. And they recommended that Paul go to the house of Manasseh of Cyprus. Paul was ready and willing to do so. He says, okay, if that's where you say I should stay, then I will gladly stay there. As I said this morning, he's ready to adapt. He didn't have his own agenda where he's going to stay. Right? If the locals thought it best for him to stay at Manasseh's house, so be it. All we know of this man is that he was an early disciple. That is one of the first Christians in Jerusalem. Uh, perhaps even one of those converted on the day of Pentecost when Peter preached and 3,000 people were saved. Manasseh may have been one of them. Or maybe by the time uh, Acts 4 and a couple weeks later, there were 5,000 people in the church total. But that was more than a decade before where Manasseh heard the words of Jesus being the Messiah and believed in Christ and embraced Him. And over time, Manasseh had proved himself faithful, ready and willing to take on a house guest. Right? Were you ready and willing to take on a house guest like Manasseh did? He was just an old faithful disciple. Hospitality was there. He just took him on. Well, the next day we see Paul coming into Jerusalem and meeting with the leaders of the church in Jerusalem. We see verse 17. When he come to Jerusalem, the brothers received us gladly. And on the following day, Paul went in with us to James, and the elders were present. And regarding the theme of my message this morning, I, I think that Paul was ready to adapt to who he should see. He should see first... James and his agenda. See, when Paul came to Jerusalem, he didn't have his own agenda, what he's going to do. First of all, he went to James and, and the elders, the leaders of the church in Jerusalem. He, he just didn't storm right into the temple area. He went in with these men first to connect with them and to hear any counsel that they might have for him. And, and boy, did he connect. Verse 19 may be small and short, but is actually long and deep and rich. After greeting them, He related one by one the things that God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. What a conversation that must have been. When Paul met him, Paul described to them one by one the things that God did through him among the Gentiles. It's God doing the work. Paul never saw his work as everything that I did. No, it was everything that God did through him. Yes, he was a servant of God, and he did this particularly. The emphasis was there among the Gentiles. I mean, after all, it was outside of Jerusalem that he traveled around 
uh, the world. He was traveling in Gentile territory. And as you think about what would Paul have said to these people as he told them one by one of all the things that God did through him. Well, he may have gone back to the first missionary journey when they, he and Barnabas traveled across Cyprus and landed in Paphos. Were there at that city, the proconsul of the city believed in Christ, being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. Or he may have told what happened in Antioch of Pisidia, where almost the whole city gathered together into the synagogue to hear the word of the Lord. And many Gentiles, Acts chapter 13, verse 48, began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as had been appointed to eternal life, believed. How God poured out His Spirit just among the visiting Gentiles into that synagogue. And the Jews were so jealous, they cast them out. But there are many Gentiles who came to faith there. And, and Paul may have told them what happened on their second missionary journey. <clears throat> as he led by, the, <clears throat> led by the Lord to go up into Macedonia. And one of the cities in Macedonia was Philippi. And do you remember in Philippi when he was put in jail and he was singing along with Titus? Silas was there singing hymns. And then the earthquake happened and the doors opened. And how the Philippian jailers, seeing that they didn't escape, said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And Paul said, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved, you and all your household. And he was saved. He believed. His household believed. And they were baptized after that. Could have told about that. Another city in Macedonia was Thessalonica where Paul may have told the story of how many devout Greeks believed in Jesus. Acts 17, verse 4. Or Paul may have told what happened when he came to Achaia and visited in Corinth. He was ready to leave. The secular city. He was ready to leave because he always went to the city and gained some persecution and then he left when the persecution got too much. But Paul, the Lord said to him, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking and do not be silent, for I am with you and no one will attack you to harm you, for I have many in this city who are my people. So Paul may have stayed and mentioned about the 18 months that he was there. Of all the Gentiles then that were, were saved there in Corinth, he could have told their story, their conversion stories. Or, or maybe he told what happened on his third missionary journey. How a great many Jews and Gentiles came to Christ in Ephesus. Acts 19, verse 10. He may have told them about the extraordinary miracles that God was doing through him in Ephesus. How he spent three years there just, just teaching the disciples and seeing many come to faith. Paul may have told about the great generosity of the churches in Macedonia who gave out of their poverty to help the impoverished Jews, Jewish Christians in Jerusalem. Which, by the way, is why he was in Jerusalem in the first place. He had a gift from Macedonia. He's bringing back to provide for the poor Christians in Jerusalem. And these are the sorts of things that Paul may have said to James and the elders as he related one by one the things that God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. You know, missionary stories are fascinating, aren't they? I mean, Brother Andrew had some stories to tell. I mean, for instance, right, here, here's a story that Brother Andrew tells of his first visit to Yugoslavia in his VW Beetle. And I'm just going to read from his, his book just to kind of give you a flavor of a missionary story which is similar to the sorts of things that Paul may have said. He said this, Just ahead was the Yugoslav border, and for the first time in my life, I was about to enter a communist country on my own instead of a group invited and sponsored by the government. I stopped the little VW on the outskirts of the tiny Austrian village and took stock. The Yugoslav government in 1957 permitted visitors to bring in only articles for their personal use. Anything new or anything in quantity was suspect because of the black market, um, thrive, because of black market thriving all over the country. Printed material especially was liable to be confiscated at the border, no matter how small the quantity, because coming from out of the country, it was regarded as foreign propaganda. And I've read this before, but I'll read it again in context. Now, here I was in the car, luggage literally bulging with tracts, Bibles, and portions of Bibles. How was I to get them past the border guard? And so, for the first of many times, I said the prayer of God's smuggler. Lord, in my luggage, I have Scripture that I want to take to your children across the border. When you are on earth, you made blind eyes see. Now I pray that you make, make seeing eyes blind. Do not let the guard see those things that you do not want them to see. And so, armed with this prayer... I started the motor and drove up to the barrier. The two guards appeared both startled and pleased to see me. I, I wondered how much business came their way from the way they stared at my passport. It might have been the first Dutch one they had ever seen. And there were just a few formalities to attend to. They assured me in German that I could be on my way. 
And one of the guards began poking around in my camping gear in the corners and folds of my sleeping bag and the tents were boxes of tracks. Lord, make those seeing eyes blind. Do you have anything to declare? Well, I have my money and my a wristwatch and a camera. The other guard was looking inside the VW. He asked me to take out a suitcase. I knew that there were tracks scattered through my clothing. Of course, sir, I said. I, I pulled the front seat forward and dragged the suitcase out. I placed it on the ground and opened the lid, and the guard lifted the shirts that lay on top beneath them, and now in plain sight was a pile of tracks in two different Yugoslavian languages, Croatian and Slovene. How is God going to handle this situation? It seems dry for this time of year, I said to the other guard, and without looking at the fellow who was inspecting the suitcase, I fell into a conversation about the weather. I told them about my own homeland, how it was always wet on the polders, that is the, the lowland. Finally, when I could stand the suspense no longer, I looked behind me, and the first guard wasn't even glancing at my suitcase. He was listening to our conversation. When I turned around, he caught himself and looked up. Well then, do you have anything else to declare? Only small things, I said. The tracks were small, after all. We won't be bothered with them, said the guard. He nodded to me that I could close the suitcase and with a little salute handed me back my passport. My first stop was in Zagreb. I had been given the name of a Christian leader there whom I shall call Jamil. The name had come from the Dutch Bible Society which listed him as a man who occasionally ordered Bibles in quantity. However, they had not heard from him since Tito had become the premier in 1945. We're talking a dozen years later. And I hardly dared to hope that he'd still be living at the same address. But with no other choice, I had, a caref- I had written a carefully worded letter stating that towards the end of March, a Dutchman might visit his country, and now I was driving into Zagreb looking for his address. To underline the wonders of that first Christian contact in Yugoslavia, I just have to tell you what happened in my letter, even though, of course, I did not know the whole story until later. It had been delivered to the address all right, but Jamil had long since moved. The new tenant did not know his whereabouts and returned the letter to the post office. There it was held up for about two weeks while a search was made for Jamil's new address. And on the very day I entered Yugoslavia, it was finally delivered. Jamil read it, puzzled, and who was this mysterious Dutchman? Was it safe to try contacting him? And with nothing better than a vague feeling that he should do something, Jamil boarded a tram and went to his old apartment house. But then what? Jamil stood on the sidewalk wondering how to proceed. Had the Dutchman already arrived and gone about asking for a certain Jamil? Did he dare go to the new tenant with suspicious story that someday an unnamed Dutchman might call asking for him? What on earth should he do? And it was at that moment that I pulled up to the curb and stopped my car. I stepped out not more than two feet away from Jamil, who of course recognized me at once from my license plate. He seized my hands and we put our stories together. And Jamil was overjoyed at having a foreign Christian in his country. He repeated the theme I'd heard first in Poland, that just being there meant everything. They felt so isolated and so alone. And of course, he would help me set up contacts with believers in the country. And there's a sovereign working God. There's just one missionary story that Brother Andrew told of just the starting of God's sovereign working of getting Bibles behind the Iron Curtain. And I think similarly here, even in verse 19, Paul would have shared similar stories uh, to James and the elders of the church there in Jerusalem about how God was working in the midst of the people uh, of the Gentiles, of the land, of all which we like. Many stories probably that aren't even in the scriptures that we don't know about would have told them as he went on and on, sharing one by one the things that God had done among the Gentiles. And when they heard it, verse 20, they glorified God. Of course they glorified God. John Stott said in his commentary, the evidence of God's grace towards the Gentiles was indisputable, and the only appropriate response was worship. The joyful praise of James and the elders was not even grudging. It was spontaneous and genuine. But James and the elders were aware of problem in Jerusalem and gave Paul some counsel. And this is my, my last point this morning, and this is where we really see Paul adapting a situation uh, adapting to the situation. Well, okay, so what, what should he do? Um, because what he does is he basically bends with those who might take issue with his life. So listen to the counsel the elders gave Paul regarding the dealing with the Jews in Jerusalem. He said this in verse 20. He says, they glorify God, and they said to him, like, it's great, great, great. And then almost instantly they said, okay, but we got a problem. <laughs> he says, You see, brother, how many thousands there are among the Jews of those who have believed. They're all zealous for the law. 
And they've been told about you that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or walk according to their customs. <clears throat> now, the customs in Jerusalem were different than the customs of the churches in the Gentile world where Paul had been ministering. In, in Jerusalem, the Jews had, had grown up on the law, they had been taught the law, they kept the law, and even as it says here in verse 20, verse 20 that they are zealous for the law. Those who were in Jerusalem believed in Jesus and continued to keep just many aspects of the law. If the law is not contrary to God, it shows us how to live. And so they kept lots of things of the law. And further, right, in keeping the law, they, they were not alienating themselves from the Jews who were there in the city. Because the Jews in the city kept the law, and so it was just easy and comfortable and right for the custom of the Jewish church to be keeping much of the law. Now, the biggest outward sign of the law keeping was circumcision. And the Jews in Jerusalem, the, the, the believing Jews in Jerusalem, just kept up on that practice. But in Gentile lands, the customs are far different. Circumcision was not prominent in the culture, nor was it prominent in the church. And the Jerusalem Council back in Acts 15 said that Gentiles were not required to be circumcised to be saved. Remember at that council, Peter stood up and, and said, right, we believe that we should be saved by the grace of our Lord Jesus just as they will. See, it's grace by which you're, you're saved. And so, so Paul didn't press circumcision upon the Gentiles. In fact, it would have been super strange to have done so. It would have gone beyond grace. And it's not that Paul wasn't concerned about the issue. In fact, on the second missionary journey in Acts chapter 16, it tells about meeting this man, Timothy, whose father was Greek, mother was Jewish, Everyone knew he wasn't circumcised, and so he said, you know what, for offense sake, let Timothy, you should be circumcised. And he himself circumcised Timothy. So it's not to give offense to the Jews in the lands to which they're going. So Paul didn't, verse 20, this is totally untrue, they've been told about you, teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or walk according to the customs. He told Timothy to be circumcised. So that certainly was, was not true. But for the believing Jews in Jerusalem, in their own little culture, their own little Jerusalem church culture, that was a big deal. As Simon Kistemacher wrote, such a practice would place Paul outside the mainstream. As a result, really, his ministry in Jerusalem would be limited. Paul would cause unnecessary distraction and disunity in the church. And I would just say, it's not unlike our culture as well today. The culture at Rock Valley Bible Church is different than the culture of other churches across our land. In fact, even I remember someone visiting our church from our grandmother church, the church that started Kishwaukee Bible Church in Ekelb that started us, and he came and visited. He said, wow, Steve, things at Rock Valley Bible Church are a bit different than they are at Grace Church of Page. And I said, you think? And he's just like, yeah, they are. It's just a different culture of a different church. Um, you know, there are some churches, I'm, I'm going to paint for you a picture of some churches that require you to dress up for church every Sunday morning, Right? Uh, men with suits and ties and women with dresses. And uh, in fact, uh, we had a, a man come to our church from one of those churches, and he was shocked that the worship leader was wearing sandals. I was like, whoa, that's different. He's wearing sandals up front. Like, just there's a different sort of culture. Uh, uh, some churches preach only from the King James ver Version, believing it to be the Word of God, the only version, and you have to preach from that, that version. Some churches sing only hymns. Right? There's different cultures. And so, so you think about this Jerusalem culture being surrounded by all these Jews, just the culture was in the church, we just kept a lot of laws. Not, not because that was going to save us, but that's just what we did, so as not to bring an offense to the Jewish people all around, and so as to help people growing up in the church, not to do so, or to do so, whatever. And so you think about, if I would minister in one of those churches, right, if I, asked, I was asked to come and preach to one of those churches, I would adapt I would wear a suit, I would preach from the King James, and I would not say a thing about the old, um, just the old hymns and how, how bad they are. I would not say that. I would gladly sing those, those hymns. I wouldn't say anything about how old and stuffy they are and how they need to have something that's at least, you know, not 150 years old. I wouldn't say that. I would, just, I would just go in, I'd just adapt. If that's where their culture is, that's what I would do with their culture. And this is exactly what Paul is doing. 
He's going to be told, right, just adapt to our culture. The question is, right, verse 22, then, then what's to be done? James asked that rhetorically, the elders do. And here's the deal, is that they will certainly hear that you have come. Do therefore what we tell you, for we have four men who are under a vow. Take these men and purify yourself along with them and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads. Thus, all will know that there's nothing in what they have been told about you, but that you yourself also live in observance to the law. And these four men were probably taking a, a Nazarite vow. The, the details are told in, in Numbers chapter 6. Uh, when we were working our way through Acts, we were in Acts chapter 18, and verse 18. We saw Paul had, had also taken a, a vow, and, and at Sencrea, he had, had cut his hair as well. And so Paul wasn't opposed to this Nazarite vow. Somehow it's for purification. We don't know why they were purifying themselves. Maybe it had to do with the, the fact that Pentecost was coming. And you know, maybe they'd been defiled some way. Maybe they just made a new pledge of some type that said, hey, we're just going to really live for the Lord. Maybe something that happened. I don't know. But there are four men. And according to the requirements of number six, they needed to offer up three animals. A male lamb, a female lamb, and a ram. Now, these animals are expensive. A lamb, male lamb, female, and a ram. I mean, I'm not sure how much you could buy them for today, but it's, it's not a, a cheap sort of, sort of deal. And, and what they would do is these animals would be sacrificed along with their hair that they would cut and would be brought up in the fire. That's just what the Nazarite um, vow was about. And James and the elders asked Paul to dig deep and to pay their own expenses for them. And with that expectation, right, verse 24 is, oh, well, no, there's nothing in what they've been told about you. You yourself also live in a observance to the law, because not only would Paul pay for that, but he himself would have his hair cut to show that I'm, look, I'm, I'm doing a Nazarite vow. I, I'm keeping following number six. There's nothing wrong with that. And then verse 25 just affirms, yes, okay, so that's the Jews. This is the context in which we live here in, in Jerusalem. But as for the Gentiles who have believed, we have sent a letter with our judgment that they should abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols and from blood and from what has been strangled and from sexual immorality. You can go back to Acts chapter 15. That's what was recorded for them there. No, the Gentiles did not have to be circumcised to be saved, but to show sympathy to the Jews in whatever land they were. They, they needed to stay away from certain practices which were particularly heinous for the Jewish people. And... and and the Gentiles, certainly, this is what Paul advocated, right? Abstain the, from the things sacrificed to idols, abstain from eating the blood of that, abstain from the things that are strangled, right? Because that's so close to pagan idolatry. Just, just stay away from the pagan idolatry and stay away from sexual immorality, which would have given great offense to the Jews. And so we read in verse 26 that Paul followed the counsel of James and the elders, then Paul took the men. The next day, he purified himself along with them, went into the temple, giving notice when the days of purification would be fulfilled and the offering presented for each one of them. Just exactly what was asked of Paul. It's exactly what he did. He purified himself. He paid their expenses. And as I have mentioned in my sermon, just I think a point of application for us is here he was ready to adapt. If I need to do this so as to create peace and harmony among the church in Jerusalem, I am glad to do that. Gary read in our service today from 1 Corinthians 9. This is exactly the principle that Paul was working out here. He says, For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. 1 Corinthians 9.19. He says, For freedom, Christ says, free. That's how we started our service. Galatians 5.1. Yes, I'm free. Paul didn't have to do this Nazarite vow, but he was glad to do it. He's made himself a servant to them, with the aim of evangelism, with the aim of winning them. He says, to the Jews I became a Jew in order to win the Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, though myself not being under the law, that I might win those under the law. This is exactly what's happening in Jerusalem. They're under the law. They, they said, hey, yeah, we need to keep this. And so he went in and he bent that with pacifying the Jewish believers there, but also with a goal then to reach the Jewish people in Jerusalem. But to those outside the law, like on his Gentile missionary journey, he says in 1 Corinthians 9.21, I became as one outside the law, though being out, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I, mean, the, that I might win those outside the law. Right? In other words, right, when there are Gentile people out there, he wasn't the, he wasn't the cloistered Jew who can't even touch them, who can't, can't even associate with them. No, he was, a, he was a person and he lived as they lived. 
though there were some constraints upon the way he lived because he was under the law of Christ. He couldn't involve himself in all of their frivolities that they were, but he did so with the aim of evangelism to go after them. 1 Corinthians 9.22, to the weak I became weak that I might win the weak. I become all things to all people that by all means I might save some. This is what Paul was doing as he was adapt, adapting here into the culture. He was using all means to become all things to all people that then he might save some, rather than causing disunity and disharmony in the church. He says, I do it all for the sake of the gospel that I may share with them in its blessing. To the Jews in Jerusalem, Paul was becoming like a Jew. And to those in Gentile lands, Paul lived like Gentiles. Paul adapted his life for the sake of the gospel. And really, I think this is the big application point for us. Are you adapting your life for the sake of the gospel? Are are there ways in which you are changing and modifying what you're free to do, but maybe you wouldn't naturally do, but you're free to do um, because for those outside? Because there is a way in which people can appear, can come across in churchianity, they go out to the world and they're like, there's no connection there. Right? They're too religious, right? They're too stuffy. They're too like, like just live like the world in some regard. Not not worldly and sinful. I'm not talking about that, but but people can come across as so churchy that they're like, they don't even connect. Like these people are from a, a different planet. Are you too religious for those outside? And I think over the years you guys know I've tried to model this by playing pool. I'm still playing pool. I'm getting better. Like, as I started playing pool, I got better real fast, and now, now I'm like getting better really slowly. So I'm maybe plateauing. I'm not sure. But, but in playing pool, I still am under the law of Christ. So in the bars, I'm not drinking or swearing. But I am seeking to minister helpful to them. It is interesting, the culture of the bar. Um, a couple weeks ago, I was there, and, and this guy came up to me. I can't, did I ever tell you this? I can't remember. I came up to me, sat down, and he proceeded to tell me two dirty jokes. And I told him, I don't find that funny at all. He was like, oh, <laughs> okay. But that's the culture around there. It's just, it, dirty jokes are fair game. That's what's there. But I'm under the law of Christ and trying to be a light there without trying to, I wasn't, whatever. That was just my response to him. And I've seen him several times since then. He hasn't told me another joke yet. So that's good. But, but last, last week, I was talking with a guy who's uh, lost a lot of weight. And I asked him, how have you lost so much weight in recent days. He said, well, I might have cancer. And uh, he says he's going to, tomorrow, going to have a biopsy. Lymphoma is, is where, where it is. And so I was able to tell him about you, Andy, just of uh, just what cancer means and, and how it is and how it's a, it's a scary thing. And so just had a chance to really just sympathize with him. Didn't get to the gospel yet with him, but I will see him over and over his brother, brother place. So I might talk with him a little bit more. There was a player also in the league who died in a motorcycle accident. Zoom in, catches the back of a semi-truck, and just last week, so like nine days ago, ten days ago, last Friday, he died at the scene of the accident. The semi-driver just felt a thump, but didn't know what it was. The guy was, was zooming in there. The guy I'd seen before, hadn't met with him, hadn't played with him. But I, I'm going into their environment to be like a pool player, to win pool players if by all means possible. And pool might not be your thing. Maybe there are other things for you that you're just doing and going, saying with the Apostle Paul, to the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people that I might save some. This was Paul's motivation in taking this vow and being willing to do that. He's ready to adapt. I, so I just I think of an application. Here's Halloween's coming up. And I know there's lots of views about Halloween, right? Certainly so, you know, bad things happen on Halloween and certainly wicked <clears throat> portrayals of death and America's fasting with death. Certainly there are some bad things there. However, think about it. The one time in the year when the world is coming to your door asking you to give them something, do you turn off the lights? Or do you hide away? I remember being involved in a church years ago. We had a Reformation night at church on Halloween night. It was a wonderful time. Our kids dressed up in costumes. Um, we still laugh at it as a family. You remember who Chris and Stanley Ray... <laughs> Stanley, that was the name back then. SR. They dressed up as, do you remember their names? You don't. Bezalel and Aholiab, the two workers of the, of the uh, 
the temple. And so they got their belts out and their tools, and it was a really fun time, and all the kids came, and they had fun downstairs, and we then um, had a Reformation mess. We've even done it here at this church as well. Um, it was kind of a fun time. But I, I remember being convicted, driving away through the neighborhood, seeing all the kids out coming to my door, and I'm not giving them what I have. And I know I've advocated over the years giving out gospel tracts. Right? I've advocated just even reaching out to your neighbors to find out as much as you can on that night. So you can think about what you want to do, but Halloween might be a time to, to be all things to all men with a perchance opportunity you might save some. I'm not telling you to get involved in all this. I'm just telling you to redeem the good things about that. You don't have to address and embrace everything, right? And giving out candy doesn't mean that you embrace the occult. It means you're giving candy to a child with a smile on his face with a tract. Maybe that they'll read it. Are there other things that perhaps you can adapt, you can bend? I think one thing is kids' interests. Are your kids interested in things that then become your interests. A lot of times that, that happens, right? Your kids are interested in something, you become interested in something with them, and you do it with them. You meet other parents, you meet other families. Whether that's soccer, whether that's volleyball, whether that's theater, whether that's whatever, right? There's an easy thing, right? To become a theater mom, right? What about Christmas parties, right? When you go to Christmas parties, are, are you seeking to become all things to all people? So, so opportunities to win people. Can you bend? Like, like me, some people are so religious they can't even bend at all. Nope, this is what I got to do. And they, they're so rigid in their life that this is what they're going to do and they're never going to seek to reach out. But here I think you see Paul willing to take on this, this vow of purification going through because he just saw it for what it was. It was a way which, number six, there's nothing anti-Christian about taking a vow and promising something before the Lord and cutting your hair and giving it to a priest. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. Are there things, though, that you maybe could be doing in an effort to reach people? That, I think, is what, what Paul was, was doing. And, and next week, we're going to look and see how, how it didn't quite work, that, um, that everyone knew, right? They, they've been told about you. They they actually found out that um, Paul was there and they're so angry with Paul that they captured him. It didn't really work, but he was trying to adapt. He was willing to adapt. And I think that's the message that we would have from this text. So let's pray. Father, I pray that among all of us that you would give us a heart to reach out. It's, it's the theme of Acts. It, Christ is calling us over and over every week to be my witnesses. God, I've just given a few illustrations about things from my life or things that might be there. People can be unique in how they can reach out to other people. God, to, to bend outside of their comfort zone even in things which are not sinful. God, but involved and engaged with other people. I would pray then that you would give opportunities for the gospel. That's what, what Paul was seeking to do here is to demonstrate that to the Jews, like he, he was one willing to submit himself to the law, though not under the law himself. What, just saw this as a harmful action. And I pray that we might evaluate what harmless actions there might be that we can do and be involved in and engaged in for the sake of the gospel, God, becoming all things to all men, that by some means we may save some. So God, I, I would pray, even as I have often prayed, God, that you would give one convert from Poole who would come and, and see a life transformed in believing and trusting in the gospel. And may each of us have a similar prayer. God, the harvest is plentiful, but the labors are few. I pray you'd send the laborers out into the harvest. I, I pray that every week. Try to every day. God, pray that we at Rock Valley Bible Church should be so stirred with the gospel that we would be go going out in our sphere of influences. To be light shining in dark places with the glory and the hope of Christ. And not, to, not to be involved just in our organization, but to know happiness and joy and eternal life forever. God, so I, I pray that you would empower us. Open eyes, even as Brother Andrew prayed, just even over the, um, uh, over the tracks and Bibles. God, you who made blind eyes see, make seeing eyes blind. And so God, I pray also that you would make spiritual eyes that cannot see now, 
God, through us, God, I pray that you would open eyes where people would see the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ, and, and come to faith and believe in him and have their lives transformed to know the joy of what it is to walk with the Savior rather than to be walking in the bondage of sin. God, so do that, please, I pray. I pray in Christ's name, amen.